This podcast is made possible by supporters like you. Mahalo. And by Atlas Insurance Agency, Hawaii's largest professional agency, helping Hawaii navigate insurance solutions since 1929. More at atlasinsurance.com. Hello, my kako. Welcome to a new episode of What School You Went? Start every conversation with that question. I'm Ron Mizutani, and today we're talking story with a pioneer in the world of taiko arts. Chizuko Endo is the co-founder of Taiko Center of the Pacific. She has traveled the globe performing and teaching dedicated to the evolution of modern taiko as we know it today. Now, several years ago, she started teaching deaf students about the art of taiko and taiko drumming. We're pleased to welcome Chizuko to PBS Hawaii. Thank nice to so see much. you again. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, you, you're a dear friend for many years, you and Kenny, and I, I thank you for coming. Before we go any further, as I do with all the guests, I ask, what school you went? I went Dorsey. Oh, I'm a katonk. You're a katonk. I'm a katonk. You, so you grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up in LA. You know Dorsey? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, you're in uh, is it the inner city? It's right? inner city, yeah. south south central Los Angeles, a Crenshaw area. Yeah. So um, I mean, help me understand that. So, but what was your mascot name first of all? The Dorsey Dons. Dons. He had like a sombrero. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So you must have had a real mix mixed plate. I school. did. Actually, uh, middle school was very mixed, uh, very well um, integrated, uh, Latinos, Asians, Caucasians, and blacks. But uh, during that time period, there was a big riot, the Watts riots, and all of the kind of the Caucasian people moved out of the area so that my high school was predominantly black and Asian. Interesting. How, did, how, do, how was that? Oh, we all got yeah. along. Yeah. I mean, there were black gangs, sure. but the black gangs fought against the black gangs, right. and there were Asian gangs, and Asian gangs fought against the Asian gangs. The leader of one of the Asian gangs used to sit behind me in homeroom. Yeah. He yeah. got in trouble. <laughs> uh, big trouble. <laughs> a, a, a very uh, <clears throat> interesting time in our history. And, uh, you know, I never, I, I didn't know you grew up in L.A. You know, you you don't come across as one katonk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, and, and that's not a bad thing. I, I know many of my friends are katongs, but people probably don't know that about you. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, welcome, welcome from Los Angeles. Thank you. You know, I usually ask our guests to sing uh, a verse of their alma mater. Can oh. you? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah, yeah. The dons, uh, the dons. Taiko, uh, kumi daiko. Yes. Yes. Uh, means. Group, group drumming. Group drumming. Yes. Now, people think, oh, it's been around forever. In some ways it has, but the taiko that we know today is is not something that's been around forever. Can you explain? Yeah, actually taiko has been around. Mm -hmm. uh, the drum itself has yeah. been around for a few thousand years, but um, the art of kumi daiko only started in the 1950s. Amazing. 1951, there was a jazz drummer in uh, Nagano Prefecture, which is the Japanese Alps region. And he had this idea to take the uh, music uh, from the local shrine and transcribe it for a group of drummers. And being a jazz drummer, he's thinking snare drum, tom-tom, bass drum. So different tones, different sized drums. And that was the beginning of kumidaiko, or group drumming. And uh, it didn't come to the United States until 1968. So, and that was the first taiko group that was established outside of Japan. Interesting. 1968. How much of the Native American uh, influence, or was there any kind of influence in that? I don't movement? think uh, the Japanese had influence from the Native American at that time. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I was very much influenced by Native American uh, culture. Um, and, and drumming and their philosophy and their shamanism. But I, I don't know if the Japanese, that's a good question. Yeah. It's a very good question, but I don't know. How, how, why, why, why were you influenced by that? What, what exposed you to the, to the Native American Native American? Culture? Um, well, actually when I went away to college, um, I, f I did my first two years at UCLA okay. and then I decided to go to a smaller college, which was in Northern California and the largest minority uh, in that area was Native American people. 
And I lived on a reservation. Wow. Uh, it's actually called a rancheria because it was state-run as opposed to federally run. And um, I took many classes in, in Native American uh, philosophy and um, arts and, and culture and just got very much involved in their, yeah, their culture. Very interesting. And, and yeah. influenced by their masks, masks right. and shamanism and also drumming. So um, actually, mask was probably my, my first love. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm so I, I'm I'm kind of blown away by that the the, the journey that took you there. Um, you know, I'm going I'm going to backtrack a little yeah, bit yeah, because yeah. we talked a little bit about ta- the drumming. Yes. In in Jap- Japanese culture, and it was used as a way to send messages, or or, or even warriors uh, would use that. Right. A little bit deeper into that, can you just share? Yeah, actually, so. Um, from ancient times, they say that the drum was used to send messages to faraway places. Uh, during harvest time, it would u- be used to chase away in- insects because of the vibration that it would make. Um, and then if there was a bountiful harvest, they would uh, do the drumming in celebration. Um, it was used at festival time. Um, uh, the, the Buddhists sometimes say it's the voice of the Buddha. Uh, but one of my favorite groups is a group called Gojin Jodaiko. I don't know if you're familiar with them, no. but um, they have a history of over 400 years. And they live actually in Noto, which is where the recent um, earthquake happened on January 1st, 2024. Um, their village at that time was just farmers and fishermen. I don't know how many families were living there, maybe 30 families. But uh, the the area was uh, they heard uh, was going to be attacked by a very strong warlord. And so they thought, how could we uh, protect our village? And they decided to wear these masks, put seaweed in their hair, wear raggedy clothes. They had one drum. They put it on the beach, and they built bonfires, and they beat the drum all night. And this warlord, he came by sea, and he saw this scene on the beach, and he thought, oh, this— village must be inhabited by demons. So he decided not to attack. He turned around and left the village in place. And this is a true story. (laughs) And so these uh, villagers felt that this taiko drum saved their village. So to this day, every man in the village plays the drum. They only play on one drum. And they do play in the the town, uh, Wajima, which was devastated by the recent earthquake, um, for the tourists, but they don't think of their drumming as entertainment. They say it's for survival, so they have to do it. Anyway, it's one of my favorite groups. But taiko has been used for so many different um, reasons, and every person plays for a different reason. And um, yeah, today uh, it has evolved into an art form that involves uh, dance and drumming and athletics and, um, yeah, it's such a fascinating subject, and the history is so rich. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about purpose, and I want to dive into that in a bit. But I want to also talk a little bit about about your life um, before Taiko. I mean, gr- granted, uh, you, like you said, you grew up in in, in Los Angeles, um, but your family history as well, uh, from what I understand, and what I've done my own research, um, you know, during the war. It was a tough time for Japanese Americans, That's right, yes. uh, including your own family, right? I mean, maybe can you share how that, what you've heard through the through the, are you Nisei or I'm Sansei. Do you Sansei? Yes. Okay. So third both, generation. Third yeah. generation, yeah. correct. So both my parents were born in the United States. Uh, my grandparents came from Japan in the early 1900s, and um, my grandfather on my mother's side uh, was a farmer. Uh, he was a pretty successful farmer in the uh, central, southern central California area. Uh, when the war broke out, he was a community leader. Um, and so he was picked up the day after Pearl Harbor. Three o'clock in the morning, they came knocking on the door and they took him away. They didn't know where he was for the first couple weeks, but um, he was separated from the family throughout the duration of the war uh, and sent to many different locations. My mother... Um, and her family uh, were interned at the Gila River uh, Reservation, um, I'm sorry, um, concentration camp in Arizona. And my mother's mother was um, blind. And so my mother, being the eldest daughter, became the, the head of the family. So it was a very difficult time for her. 
um, because her uh, her youth, well, her she was in her twenties, but um, was kind of taken away from her. She felt so she was quite bitter about the war. Um, my father, uh, his family had returned to Japan. My father had also returned to Japan, but uh, having been born in the United States, he returned after high school and re-entered another high school in San Francisco area. He uh, joined the U.S. Army a few months before Pearl Harbor, and um, uh, he served actually in Europe, um, and and his brother was in the Japanese Army. Oh, my. So they were uh, kind of fighting against each other. His brother uh, was killed in the, in the war, but it was a very difficult time for the, the families, I think, because being of Japanese ancestry, but being American citizens. Yeah. Yes. You know what? The story you just shared about grandpa and them coming in the middle of the morning night uh, following Pearl Harbor is consistent with some of the people that we talk to here in Hawaii. Same way. If, if they were viewed as a community leader, whatever that definition was, there was concern that there was spies or, or connection to to what happened. And um, yeah, that, it was such a... A dark time in our in our in our history, but it's part of you know who we are today. And um, thank you for sharing that. Yes, uh, that must have been really difficult for brother and dad, uh, your father and the two brothers, to be at war. I think so, but yeah. um, my dad really didn't talk too much about it. Yeah, yeah. The generation didn't talk much. No, no. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. You know, Taiko uh, has changed your life. It has um, taken over my life. Take, <laughs> in a good way, though, yes. right? Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's been a very important part of your life. And from what I understand, the day you met Taiko is the day you met some young, handsome lad named Kenny Endo. Well, how did you find that <laughs> out? I, I, I have you my do sources. Your work. <laughs> you do your homework. Yeah. yeah, that was a pretty amazing thing. I was actually— um, Was he cute, by the way? He was. A good looking I, guy. I thought he was cute, but I thought he's kind of young. <laughs> but I was actually um, in Vancouver at the time, and I was on my way to a, a Native American um, uh, reservation in Arizona. And I was trying to catch a ride with my, my friends. And so I drove straight from Vancouver to LA to catch this oh ride. It was gosh. like 24 hours yeah. or something. And, um, but when I got to LA, this is before cell phones, they had left the day before or that morning. They left that morning, I think. And so I was stuck uh, in L.A. and I didn't know what to do. But that weekend, um, my local temple was having their obon, uh, which is a, a festival or a ceremony that honors your ancestors. And I had heard about Taiko for many years, and I really wanted to uh, see and hear Taiko and there, were, there was a group playing at the temple that weekend, so I decided to go to the Obon. And yes, um, I knew everybody in the group because I had grown up at that temple, mm -hmm. and uh, I knew everybody in the group except Kenny. But our, our conversation really was stoked by he had lived on a reservation in Arizona, and, um, and I was on my way to a reservation in Arizona, different reservations, but that was the, the, uh, what lit our conversation. Wow, yeah. what a love story. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the beat of a drum, the different beat, right? Uh, your heart was 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 your heart beating that day? <laughs> I think so. It was alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh well, let's fast forward a little bit yep. because uh, what you folks combined together have have really has been a special journey. I'd imagine in itself, and probably could talk about it the whole time uh, that we're here together. Um, but you folks have changed many lives. You've impacted many lives through Taiko and, and the art of Taiko, both young and old. I mean, the, your students uh, runs the gamut. I mean, now you have a school. Let's let's start there because that's part of of how you're you're you know reaching out to the deaf community, and hard of hearing. But what <laughs> what drove you to say let's let's do this? Let's do. I mean, you're a mom. Uh, you had children. You have. A life, um, and then you decided to do a school. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see. Uh, we we came to Hawaii in 1990 from Japan, and we had spent 10 years in Japan. And um, Kenny started teaching uh, at the University of Hawaii uh, through their non-credit course. Um, and um, we were there for several years, and then I think our program got a little bit too big and was too noisy. So uh, we had to move out, and so then we decided that we wanted to 
uh, start the school to um, preserve the art form and also to create new music for Tycho. So that was 1994. And, um, yeah, it's just grown ever since then. Uh, we've moved from different locations uh, since 1994, and we still don't have a home uh, for our Tycho. That's one of our big dreams. It was what it was our dream when we were in Japan, and you know it's just so costly in Hawaii that um, yeah we just keep moving from uh, rental place to rental place. So how how does that work when you say you have a school but no home? Uh, so you're mobile. Is well, uh, we have a location okay. right now that we're Ranking. working out of. Um, and um, come this uh, end of this June, we may be looking for a new space again. Um, but, yeah, we've been at this current location for about the last six years. And, um, yeah, um, so the school has a, has a uh, location, but it doesn't belong to us. It's a rental location. And we do performances all over the state. Uh, we do performances on the national and international level. Yeah. You know, when, when I think about Taiko, and I was fortunate to meet Kenny and you many years ago, I think it was during the Great Aloha Run many years ago, and then that's the first time I actually, it was so empowering. Uh, I'm sure people have different feelings of what they experience. It's kind of intimidating because of the, the size of the drum, depending on which drum you have, but also the, 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 the sound that it makes is very powerful, and I just felt like, wow, I'm creating this sound. Um what do people tell you when they first strike, if that's the right word? Uh, yeah, it is empowering. I think the interesting thing about Taiko is that it's not just something that you hear, but you feel with your whole body. Some people say that they could feel it down to their bones. Uh, there is a, uh, a deaf uh, percussionist, actually, in England who is deaf, and she feels the vibration on her skin, and she could feel different sounds, different ways on her skin. Um, but I think for most people, it's, it's just that it's very physical um, and you, you can feel, you can actually feel the vibrations with your body. It's, it's, it's um, cause I want to, that's where I want to go really right now. Um, it's that vibration that the deaf com and hard of hearing community I guess that's their way of connecting besides maybe the verbal cues that you give. And so how does that work? You have a, a room full of, of, of deaf students. How are they learning? I imagine you have a, a someone helping you along with that. Yeah, I, I, I don't do American Sign Language, so I always have to have an interpreter. I do have my own way of communicating, um, and the deaf people that I work with um, – they kind of understand me, but I'm, I might be saying something weird in American Sign Language, but they <laughs> understand me. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I have to use more body movement when I'm teaching. And um, so I, I give a lot of signals with my body, like um, just raising my whole body up when I want to get ready to strike a hit. Um, but um, And then sometimes I might have them touch the skin of the uh, of the drum to just feel the vib vibration, um, or I might tap uh, a rhythm out on their body, on their shoulders, so that they can feel it. Um, but there's a lot of visual cues. I use more visual cues when I'm teaching them. Um, but it's amazing. That the first time I I taught at the deaf high school here, um, I I came out of that class and I was. So happy. I, it was like the best class I had ever taught because a lot of times in between an exercise or a, a drumming exercise, the students will talk and chat and like, oh, that was, hot. that was hard and oh, I didn't get that and what did you do? But in the deaf community or the deaf class, there is no noise. <laughs> they might be talking because they're signing to each other, but there's no uh, uh, oral uh, noise or, or, or verbal conversation. So it was very quiet. And they use their eyes. They, they, they uh, watch. Um, and so they're very focused. And sometimes, actually the first class, I thought they, they um, played better than the hearing students. Oops. Maybe I shouldn't say that. No, that's it's it's interesting. You know, the, 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 there's everybody's senses are heightened, uh, and they've shown studies of how that works. Um, to have that vibration, though, is that's a sound. 
to the, to the hearing impaired. Yes. And um, that vibration is is actually how we got our our voice to work. That's true. So that's that's a part of of that communication. But I can only imagine for yourself seeing the smiles, seeing they they know they're creating sound. They don't know what the sound sounds like, if you will, but they know they have that. That, that, that can be empowering in That's itself. That's empowering, I think, yeah. 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 The, the, before I started teaching the deaf, um, we, we invited uh, students from the deaf high school to come um, uh, experience one of our practices. And this was in a wooden building. And I had them sit on the floor. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had them sit on the floor because in a wooden building, the floors shake, the walls shake. The chairs shake. Everything vibrates with with the sound of the drums. And when they went back to school, they wrote a thank you letter. And they said they really loved the uh, taiko drums because it was so loud. (laughs) I was so amazed because here they are. They cannot hear anything, but they thought it was loud. Last night, I was at practice, and I sometimes try to uh, experience the drumming as somebody who maybe doesn't hear. Sometimes I do it as if I cannot see. Um, but I was just ho- touching the drum. It was, I wasn't playing. I was just touching the drum uh, in the back of the room. And the vibration that you could feel on the drum, and it's not even a drum that the others are playing. Nobody's playing that drum. It's just that drum is also vibrating from what everybody else is playing. Mm-hmm. And it was just amazing. Yeah. yeah. I read somewhere that Taiko provides many with a voice. In this case, that voice is... is is a powerful one it is for those a powerful who one. are hearing impaired. There's another uh, aspect of taiko drumming that I want the deaf community to experience, and that is ki ai. Ki ai is the vocalizations that we utilize during drumming, and it's a voice that we use not from our our throat, but comes from uh, the tanden, which is mm-hmm. below your belly button, and this is what we call the core. This is what my taiko teacher said is where we play taiko drumming from, from this tanden area, which is a very difficult concept to understand. But this is also where we do our vocalizations from, from below our belly button. So it's the voice that you would use if you were trying to get somebody's attention in the parking lot and um, not just in a conversation in a small room. Um, But because deaf people don't often use their voices, that I want them to also experience ki ai. They're sometimes a little bit uh, uh, inhibited to do a shouting because they don't do it mm-hmm. um, regularly. But this vocalization also creates a vibration throughout your whole body. So this is still something that I'm working on, but uh, I just want them to also experience this part of taiko drumming. Wow, very yeah. interesting. Ki ai was something I learned uh, from my dad during when I was in karate. And, uh-huh, yeah. and <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> it just went, he would punch me in my stomach. Right. <laughs> so the, that, that, but it works. And that vibration, it's not, you're right, it's not from your voice box or it's it's from your... Deep, Hata. Yes. Yeah. Some say na'o, or, but others mm, mm, say mm. differently. You know... Um, Sound, music, uh, in taiko, whether it be drumming, um, taiko drumming or any kind of drumming, it's been proven um, even with folks with Parkinson's disease and, and Down syndrome that that connection somehow is is creating not so much healing, uh, but a deep, it resonates in the body. Is that something that you think is yeah. what work, is, is that work here? Well, it's amazing. I, I've had um, some Down syndrome, Down syndrome students, uh, ADD, of course, um, um, students who have um, some kind of learning disability, and they'll come to class, and sometimes they have uh, an adult assistant to help them move their hands during the, the exercises or whatnot. But I... I would like them not to utilize their assistant and just for the student to participate. And it's amazing. There, I did have a student who had uh, Down syndrome. Um, and after the eight weeks of working with them, uh, the student, well, actually about halfway through, the student didn't want the assistant anymore and just wanted to try by themselves. And they did fine. And the parents came up to me after the eight weeks and said that it was amazing, um, the progress of their, their child. Um, so, yeah, 
I I I kind of um, uh, gravitate, or I I want to involve those people who uh, maybe are marginalized or sometimes seen as having some kind of uh, challenge in participating in activities that. Uh, other people can participate in. A lot of times, um, a student who has attention deficit, the teachers will put them in the back and, right. and pull them out of the class if they're not able to uh, participate al- along with the other students. I like them to be in the front, absolutely, so that I can really focus on them too and make sure that they're um, staying with the class. And I think that they do fine. Yeah, yeah. I I was a board member at Easter Seals uh, for many years. Several, several, maybe a couple of decades ago, but one of the things that I learned, and um, it was actually through a relationship with a with a deaf young boy, uh, Pono Tokioko, who's a who's a who's a man today. Um, but it, the thing that will always be a part of my world, and this is what I'm hearing from you right now, there are no limitations, and Taiko is that bridge I think that can help teach the world that there are no limitations. Mm. And whether you have Down syndrome, whether you cannot hear, whether you cannot see, this this is an amazing tool. It not only saves that community in Japan that you spoke of, it can save lives. Mm, I, I agree. I think the Taiko has a vibration. It has a power to heal the world. It has a, a power that I feel has not yet been really unleashed. Um, you know, the first Taiko group was established in the 1950s in this Nagano prefecture, came to the United States in 1968. It's all over the world. It, it's amazing. Um, we went to Europe in 2019. Well, actually, we've been to Europe many times, but in 2019, when we went, I was so surprised at how evolved and how um, popular the Taiko has become. I mean, it's Western Europe, Eastern Europe, it's, it was in South Africa. I'm not sure if that group is still there or not. So, uh, South America, the America North America, um, it's all over Asia, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Tanzania. Amazing. It's all over the world, and, um, yeah, and it's still growing. It, it has a vibration that, um, yeah, has, I, I feel has the power to heal. Absolutely, power to heal, and and healing can go in all kinds of different directions. Um, people in correctional facilities are are gravitating to that as well, and uh, I can imagine that I can imagine what that looks like, even with a room full of folks who have been, you know, if you will, shunned by community for their for their mistakes in life. They are one of our best audiences. Interesting. They're, they are um, they are very focused and they appreciate appreciate when we come in. We do lecture demonstrations at the correctional facilities. Um, we've been working with Habilitat uh, for over 20 years. Every year we go and do a program. Um, the correctional facilities don't necessarily want us to come in and work with the inmates, but um, we think it has a power to heal. Yeah. I do believe that. I do believe that. So I'm going to go just one more question yes. I have because, you know, um, I remember, okay, so you folks would often come to the news station at KHON, and and um, let's be honest, Taiko is not for everyone. Some people go, oh, too loud. Yep. I'm going to get a headache, you know, and I love it. I mean, I would be like, I will be in the front row because uh, I think it's such a powerful uh, vehicle of, of sound, music, everything. But it's not for everyone. That's right. Yeah. So how, how, how do you uh, balance that? With those in the audience who say, oh, too much. Well, they probably wouldn't come in the <laughs> first place. Uh, a lot of times people will hire us and then they say, can you play softly? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I've only had one experience where somebody told me it was uh, making them feel bad. And so I asked them to maybe just step outside. So that vibration has something to do with bringing up something that could be deep inside somebody's body. Sure. And um, so I, I think that's part of it. Um, but, yeah, people who don't like it, um, they may come to class one time and then they say it's not for them. That's fine. Yes. It's not for everybody. Exactly. Yeah, but you know what? Sometimes you got to get the yuck out, <laughs> right? And yes. if this pulls that yuck out because yes. it's uncomfortable to deal with, 
stay the course, follow your heart. You never know. You never know what kind of healing is going on in there, That's even right. with the yuck that yeah. you feel. <laughs> That's my opinion. I mean, I get it. People have migraines. People understand uh, whatever they're feeling, and I respect that. But give it a chance, yeah? Chizuko, thank you so much for the work you and Kenny do. Um, You know, when you look at the big picture of history and you think about how young Taiko is, yet the impact it's making across the globe in in relatively short time, can you imagine where we'll be in— in 50 years? Well, I hope we're still alive in 50 <laughs> well, years. <laughs> I tell you what, I won't be here, but uh, but I know That's that Taiko will be. Yeah. Maybe you and Kenny will. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. It's been a pleasure. It really has. Thank you for the history lesson and, and sharing your story. But most of all, thank you for what you folks do with our community. Thank you. And uh, now, especially with our deaf, deaf uh, community and, and those who... You know, may have, may have been placed in the back of the class. Now they're in the front. Yeah, and you know, the deaf people, sometimes, they don't like to be considered as having a disability. Um, they just speak or they communicate in a different language. So, yeah. Yeah. The word disability, the big word in there is ability. Ability, that's correct. Exactly. <laughs> Malo Nui for joining us, folks. Join us next week, another episode of What School You Went. Until next time. Ahuiho. What School You Went is a PBS Hawaii production. Music by Taimane Gardner. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And tell your friends. You can find us on pbshawaii.org and everywhere you get your podcasts.